Good morning, Batavia Assembly of God. I'm excited to be here again, but I'm not excited that you're not here with me. I can tell you that I'm anticipating, I'm anticipating you being here. It seems like as every week that goes by, there's a, a larger sense of anticipation in my heart for the day that we're back. And I, I don't know if I can stress it anymore every week. It just seems like more and more every week I'm wanting you here. I want to see your smile. I want to, see, I want to, I want to hear what you're going through. Uh, I want to hear your challenges. I want to hear about your victories. I want to hear about it all. And until you're here with us in the sanctuary, I feel like I'm being held back from you. And I want you to know that I love you. I want you to know that the leadership, the pastors love you. We miss you so much. We're just so glad, though, today that you've come and you're joining us. I pray that today you'd experience the power and the presence of God in a real way, that you'll sense his glory fill your temple, the temple of your heart, as we go through the worship and the word of God. I want to encourage you now to just enter into a time of worship where you're meeting with God, where you're surrendering to the Lord, where you're letting all the distractions fade away and you're tuning right in to what the Lord is wanting to do in you through worship as he prepares your heart for the word so that you could receive it. And then from there, so that you can go live the word of God that you just heard, may now, may this moment be a moment where God just comes and gets a hold of you in a real and a special way. Let's just enter into a time of worship as Pastor Justin leads us. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Join me this morning as we sing praises to the King. Amen.
spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so your fault, steal your love far from me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, when I felt no worth, you paid it all for me, yeah. You have been so, so
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. I just want to thank Pastor Justin for bringing us into an awesome time of worship again. I know that it's not easy week after week leading worship from home. Like, what a challenge is that when you've got a room full and a house full of your family and, and yet you're entering in and 
bringing us all into the throne room of God. I just want to thank Jamie and the kids for, for just giving us this opportunity. I'm sure that, that you're worshiping along with us, but I just want to say thank you to the DiMartinos for the investment that you're making every Sunday into each one of our lives. It's powerful, it's life-changing, and just to be honest, I'll tell you that it leaves me wanting for more, and, and that's the church I want to be a part of, a church that's creating a longing in my heart for more, like saying, all right, there's got to be more, and so we're just going to continue on surrendering together, searching together, seeking together, believing together, worshiping together, coming together. I can't wait for the day that we come together. It's going to be an awesome moment. I do want to encourage you before we get into the Word, if you're not a member of the church on Friday, I placed a video on Facebook, an update sharing with you that you could be a member. There's going to be a Zoom meeting for those that want to be members. It's going to be a 13-week course. It's going to be an opportunity for you to hear all about what we believe and who we are. You want to be a part of a church, and you want to know what they believe. And so if you're not a member, I encourage you to do this so that you can also say, as a member, that I believe in what God's doing in the church. I believe what he's doing in other people's lives is powerful. I believe in the vision of the church, and I want to go with the church in the direction that God is sending them. And I want to be a part of that group. So if that's your desire, would you go ahead and sign up for the membership class? You won't regret it. And you'll go deeper in Christ. You'll be more discipled in the end than you are today. So I just want to encourage you in that. With that said, let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we come before you today. And Lord, there's a longing inside of our hearts for more of you. Lord, we are not satisfied with where we are yet. And that's why, Lord, on this Sunday morning, we're sitting here yearning for more of you. Lord, it's, this is why we are, are tuning in. Lord, we're focusing our heart on you. Lord, not on what's coming later, not what's coming on, on next, later in the week, not what's happened in the past week. Lord, right now, we're just saying that, God, you've got all of us. You've got our full attention. And so, Lord, we ask that you would just speak in an awesome and powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of our message this morning is this, Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus is the center of it all. This week, God took me on a journey. Have you ever had someone tell you, okay, get ready, we're about to go somewhere exciting. And and a lot of times what I've said is, okay, that's great, but, but where? Where are we going? And then they would say, well, don't worry about it. Just just get ready. We're going to go and you're going to have a great time on this journey that we're about to go on. Just get ready. A few years back, I went to Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida. And in one of the parks, there was a roller coaster called the Hulk. It's a green roller coaster. It, it's impressive when you walk up to the amusement park. That's what you see. And there, it looks scary. It, it looks beyond what any human being should ever want to do in their lifetime. It's big, it's fast, it's a roller coaster. Well, I went on it. And let me tell you that it starts out like every other roller coaster. You climb the first, that first hill slowly. So just like every roller coaster, that first hill, right, it usually is the biggest. And you're going up, 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 and you can hear the ticks, right? Well, on the Hulk, you don't hear ticks. I don't know if it's on a belt or what it's on, but you're just moving up, 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 up. You get about halfway there, and then it stops. And I'm on this roller coaster. I'm looking around. I'm like, well, all right, well, maybe we're waiting for the other roller coaster that's spinning around the track to make its way back. And so we're, we're just sitting here. We're paused for about three seconds. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the brakes released, and it felt like, I was ready to be shot out of a cannon. I literally thought that we were about to go into the clouds. The power and the thrust of that moment, it was exciting. It was scary. It was everything all all wrapped in, in one. On a roller coaster, there are so many dips. There's so many turns. There's ups and there's downs. It's adventure. Well, think about life and the adventure of life. On a roller coaster, there's only one thing that really matters, and that's that you're strapped in. That's that you're completely secured into the center of that little car that you're in. Have you ever double-checked 
when you're, when, uh, come on, all of us have double checked when we're in the roller coaster, right? Not in the roller coaster, but when you first get in and they're doing the check to make sure everybody's secure, right? Once they're done checking you, how many of you are checking again? Right? You just want to make sure you're checking your seatbelt, you're making sure that you're strapped in. And on that thought, I just want to ask you, like, do you really want to know, right, after they push that button for you to go? Like, a lot of times I'm checking and we're already going. What if you're not really strapped in? You probably really don't want to know. So just word for the wise, after they check, don't check again. If you're going to fly out of there, well, then just do it without knowing that it's going to happen. Be a lot more of an adventure. <laughs> Life is an adventure. It's an adventure. Some things are more important than others. And this one detail is most important when it comes to roller coasters. But, but what about life? What's the most important thing when it, when it comes to life? Some things are more important than others. This past week, God spoke to me about some of those most important things. Between my personal devotions and and a book that I'm reading called Soul Keeping by John Ortberg, he spoke loud and God spoke clear. I don't don't do my devotions in the morning looking for my next message. Really, those, those moments are just for me and God. I love waking up in the morning. I jump in the shower. I make coffee. And then I'm sitting there reading my Bible, doing my devotions. And God is speaking to me. But, but there are certain days, there are certain weeks that he'll speak to me loud and clear. And there'll be a principle that, that he's showing me, a truth that he's showing me that I can't get out of my heart. And, and so I just feel like it needs to echo from the heart of God through the man of God, so to speak. He's spoken into me, and now it's time to declare it to you. This week I was reading 1 Kings chapter 6. King Solomon had the awesome responsibility to build the temple of God. Within this chapter and those surrounding it, it tells all about him building the temple. In verse 14, it begins to describe the temple's interior and how it was built to every detail. In verse 19, it talks about how Solomon prepared the inner sanctuary, a place where the Ark of the Covenant would be placed. This was the inner sanctuary, the the sanctuary of it all, the place where God dwelt. Turn to Hebrews chapter, chapter 9, verse 1. I want to share a few scriptures with you that, that kind of put these two scriptures together. 1 Kings chapter 6 and those surrounding chapters. And then you've got Jesus coming into the picture. And so let's, let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 through 8. It says, Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was, was set up. In its first room were the, were the lampstand and the table and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenants. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, Cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people had committed in ignorance." The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations applying until the time of the new order. Then in in verse 11 and 12 it says, When Jesus came as the high priest of the good things that that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not part of this creation. 
He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Verse 14, and last verse, it says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. And it was at this point, church, that Jesus became the center. What a powerful thought of Jesus coming to the center of our soul, the center of our lives, that we might receive redemption for our souls so that our consciences could, could be made clear, so that we could stand holy before God in righteousness. Not in our own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ because of the perfect lamb that was slain for all mankind. Because of the blood of Jesus, the only, the only sacrifice that, that could bring true redemption to all of mankind. What do we see here in 1 Kings and, and in Hebrews? We see, we see God revealed. We see he is the center of it all. We see God highlighting the importance of the inner sanctuary. We see it in 1 Kings. The inner sanctuary, the most holy place, was important. We see Jesus coming and fulfilling the old law, creating a new sanctuary, and a, a, a most holy place, not just a room, a physical room to walk into, but the most holy place, the inner sanctuary of our hearts. We cannot ignore that God established the most holy place it's a place for him to dwell. God created you. God created me. God created everybody in your house. God created everybody in your family. God created everybody to the uttermost most parts of the earth. And when he created them, he created them with an inner, an inner sanctuary. A place where he desires to dwell and to be. We see that there's an old way. And there's a new way of doing things. We see the old way that tells us that if we want to meet with God, we must go to a place called the inner sanctuary, the most holy place. But at the, at the death of Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice, the veil that separated us and God was torn in two. There's no separation between us and God at this point right now. At the death of, of Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice, the veil was torn in two. It was obvious that God from the beginning was saying to us that he wanted to be the center of it all. God wants to be the center of it all. He wants, when it comes to you, him creating you, your innermost being, he doesn't want anything else filling that spot that he created for himself. It's a place, it's like that place of the, the Ark of the Covenant. Nothing else belonged there except for God in his presence. Nothing else belongs within the deep part of our soul other than God and his presence. It's his spot. He resides there. God kicked it up a notch when he made a way to live within the heart of man. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, this is what it says. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. The Holy Spirit is in you. He's created that most holy place so that he could be in you. God created an inner sanctuary, a most holy place within each of us. It's the center of who we are. So God, we see God revealing. He's the center of it all. That's point number one. Point number two this morning is this. We all have a sense about us, and it's this. We have a craving to fill the center. I've got to say, we, we underestimate. God's desire to be the personal center of our universe. We, we underestimate that. We think that sometimes it's okay to have something else in that center. Whatever we're the most passionate about at the moment, 
will probably fill that center. But we underestimate God's desire to be, to be the center. Let's look at what the Word of God says. It, it says in Exodus 34, 14, For you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, which, by the way, it's a capital J, is a jealous God. He is a jealous God. He's not jealous when you're excited and passionate about something good that's happening in your life. He's not jealous about that. He's not jealous that he's blessed you with maybe a good job or a beautiful family. He's not jealous that you have a nice house or a nice car or, or he's not jealous of the personality that he's given you. I mean, these are all blessings and gifts that he's given you. But what he is, je what he is jealous for, what he will not give up to anything or anybody else is the most holy place, the inner sanctuary. The center of it all. He is a jealous God for that place. And he challenges us to guard, to guard our hearts, for it's the wellspring of our life. And if he's at the center of it all, and we're guarding our hearts, we're guarding the center, the wellspring is going to be the flood, flooding of the Holy Spirit out of us. As we, as we speak and minister to people that are around us. Deuteronomy 4, 23 and 24 says, Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything. The Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. It says don't, don't put anything that God forbids as an idol in your life. And I want to say what he's talking about is that center place that he's created for himself. He's a jealous God. He's an all-consuming fire. And so do you want the Holy Spirit burning inside of you? You can't have the Holy Spirit burning inside of you like he wants to. If you've got something else in that spot that's just there taking up the space where the Holy Spirit should be burning, he's a jealous God for that space. Why did God say this to his people? Because he knew we have a strong craving to fill the center of our hearts. And many times we're tempted to fill it with something other than him. Something other than him. He's a jealous God. He doesn't want anything except him at the center. God knows that when we lack him at the center of our souls... You know what happens when he's not the center? We're a mess. You ever wake up and you go, why is my life such a mess? Why am I feeling the way I am? Why am I overcome with emotions? Why is my mind plagued with all these things? I can tell you why. It's because God is not at the center. You could say, well, I love Jesus and, you know, uh, I read my Bible. Well, you know what? I, I, I've been going to every live stream since it started and so I love Jesus. Yeah, it's, it's loving Jesus enough to not let anything else in the center because if something else is in the center, you're going to be a mess. We become double-minded when something else is at the center. God knew that. Our souls become split, divided, uncentered. But when Jesus is the center, we become laser-focused. We see life completely differently. We can begin to pinpoint what God is saying, trying to say to us. We can pinpoint it because we're, we're centered we're centered with God. We understand life in a whole new way because we have a magnified clarity. We're seeing beyond 2020 vision. We're seeing with God vision. We're seeing with Holy Spirit vision. We're seeing life with complete clarity. You wonder what God has for your future. You've got peace enough in the moment to say, God, whatever it is, it's all okay because it's as clear as day that you love me and I love you and you're at the center and you've got my best. And when you begin to live in that place, it's going to begin to reveal your future and you're going to see things clearly without doubt, with confidence. You're going to be able to walk into your future when God is at the center. Our decisions become sure. Our life has a sense of surety to it. Our center is filled correctly. A soul without Jesus at the center 
what it feels like is completely vulnerable. Have you ever felt like you were in a vulnerable place just physically? It's not a good feeling. You, you feel like something's about to happen. When you've got Christ at the center, you are completely protected. Without Christ at the center, you are completely vulnerable to whatever the world would bring its way because it will try to have its effects on you. Christ at the center, you, you know, those things never even make their way into your heart. Christ not at the center. They come in and they overwhelm your heart. We begin to look for other people to give us direction. We look to others to find our way back to the center. You're never going to find your way back to the center trying to follow the path of somebody else. Follow the path of the Spirit and put Him back where He belongs. We also look to our circumstances for security, but our circumstances only reveal how, how truly vulnerable we really are. We see this in, in two powerful men of God in the Bible. We see it in David and we see it in Elijah. David's circumstance in, in 2 Samuel chapter 15 had him running from Absalom. And he became completely exhausted and tired. He stopped and he rested, it says in the Word. And that lit the literal translation describes David's need in that moment to re-soul or re-center himself. And so he was running with reckless abandon trying to keep himself protected but he was doing it in, in his own strength. And he got to a place where he was tired and he had to sit and he had to recenter, kind of resoul, get God at the center again. About six weeks ago, I preached the message on the quiet place. And I can tell you that my time of recentering is in the quietness of God. You know, sometimes God is going to speak in many different ways. Sometimes he's going to speak through the wind. Sometimes he's going to speak through the fire. Sometimes he's going to speak. I mean, in so many different ways, but then I would say most of the time for me that God speaks through silence. God speaks through, the, through, through silence, just sitting before him silent and allowing him to come back to that center place. It's where the most peace is. Elijah in, in 1 Kings 19, right after seeing God perform a mighty miracle, he found himself running from the threat of Jezebel. He ran. He ran and he hid. When he, when he did, when did he have the, excuse me, when did he have the strength to, to go again? So he ran and hid and he, he didn't have any strength. He even wanted to die in that moment. But when did he have the strength to go again? When his soul found its center again. When, it, when his soul found its center in Christ. And I encourage you to read that story. And you'll see it happen. It's a beautiful story. Do you want to hear a powerful truth today? Here it is. If our soul's center has anything but Christ in it, we live vulnerable. David, Elijah, two powerful men of God were at a place of vulnerability. But then they reeled it back in. And put God where he belonged. Life is complicated. Stuff happens. Our jobs become threatened. Friends betray us. We can't sleep at night. Our health becomes uncertain. This all happens. It's just part of life. This happens. This is when being centered for us in Jesus matters most. When, these, when life is happening, being centered is what matters most, being centered in Christ. If your soul lacks a center when, when life comes at you hard and when life comes at you fast, what will happen is you'll be, quickly, you'll be quickly thrown off. You'll be thrown off emotionally, mentally, you'll be thrown off. But mo most worrisome, spiritually, you'll be thrown off. Life comes at us quickly. When our soul is not centered in God, we define ourselves by, by what we make of ourselves instead of what God makes of us. Our world overcomes us rather than God overcoming us. When our soul is not centered, we begin to define ourselves by, by who we are and what we've made of our own being Instead of what God desires to make of us. We define ourselves by our accomplishments, by our physical appearance, by our title, by our friends. John Ortberg says this, The soul without a center is like trying to build a house over a sinkhole. Like you're trying to build your life right now. 
You're, you're trying to do it your way, by your friends, by your, your, your job, by your appearances, by all these things, by through your own pride. But it's like trying to build a house in a sinkhole. It's only going to fall through. You build your house on Christ, and now it's a sure foundation. We are most satisfied within Within, when Jesus is at the center of it all, believing this and everything about this changes everything in life. I think a great thing that we can say as an individual is this, and I'll say this before you today. I I don't want to be Dan made. I want to be God made. I don't want to make, try and make myself something. Just to look back on it all at the end of my life and see that all of my strivings was, were all for nothing. Instead, I want to live and I want God. I want to be God made. I want God to be making investments into my life, the whole journey of my life, so that one day when I do look back, I'm not going to just see me squandering my life trying to do and be what I wanted to be. But instead, with Christ at the center of it all, I'm seeing what he made me to be. And all of the differences made along the way because of him in me. Last point this morning. Every soul, every soul needs a captain. When Jesus is the captain of your soul, you don't need to have all the answers because you know the one who does. Amen? Come on, can you shout amen even from your living room or wherever you are today? When, when Jesus is the captain of your soul, we don't need to have all the answers of life because we know the one who does. A soul with Jesus as the captain always knows it has someone greater than themselves to hold their pain, to hold their fear, their anxiety, their worry, their, their discouragement, their troubled hearts. The captain of, of my soul carries those things because he never designed it that I would carry those things. What is the true spiritual life at its best? What does it look like? What does true spiritual life look like at its best? This is what it looks like when, when nothing becomes more important than getting back to the center. Well, how about this? When we quench the thirst of our soul with a drink from the hand and the heart of the captain of our ship. When we have God Almighty in the middle of our hearts, our thoughts, our will, and our way. What is true spiritual life at its best? How about this? When we acknowledge the greatest longing of our soul is for our center to be filled with God only. When is the true spiritual life at its best? When we realize, when we believe, and when we act knowing that God only, a God only heart is, is the fullest, is the most satisfied, is the most completely equipped to live life on this earth. And lastly, when is true spiritual life at its best? When our whole outside world revolves, when it revolves on our whole Jesus, our whole Jesus-centered inside world. My whole outward world revolves around my inward world in Christ Jesus. That's centered, centered in him. And when it is, it feels good to do life. Because I know that he holds my whole world in his hands. And if he can do that, that's enough. That's enough for me. And I'll never forget it. Christ is at the center. Pastor Justin is going to sing a song that, that describes Jesus and who he is. He is our rock. He is our redeemer. He is our center. You've heard the words shared this morning. I'm going to ask that while you listen to this song that Pastor Justin's about to sing, that you would just close in. And allow the Holy Spirit to just work on you. Jesus being your center. Pastor Justin, would you lead us this morning? There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation. Jesus, there is a light that overwhelms the darkness, there is a kingdom that forever reigns, there is a freedom from the chains that bind us, and Jesus.
Pastor Justin, thank you for leading us in that song, a song that just makes us think about who Christ is to us and for us, what, do we, what we need him to be, what we really want and long for him to be. You see, there's no one like Jesus, and there's no one or no thing that can be the center. Today, we're going to declare that he is the captain of our souls. We're going to walk around this week when, when things are coming against us, when we're feeling discouraged because we're in the house again for a whole other week. We're not going to be down and in the dundrums. Instead, what we're going to say is, you know what, God? Today, you're ordering my life. You're the center of my soul. You're the captain of my soul. And God, I'm going forward in the mission that you've called, us, called me to. A soul without a center is like an unplugged computer. It's like a fish left on the side of the banks of a, of a river. It's like a car without a steering wheel. And then eventually it crashes and dies. It's time. It's time that we start living the way God designed us. Jesus at the center of it all. And may we say like the psalmist in Psalm 63 verse 1. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we close out this morning knowing that you desire to be in the most holy place that you created. Lord, you created that place that so many, so many are searching to fill with other things. Lord, there are people all over the world right now that have not discovered what we just discovered this morning. 
Lord, I pray that they would. Lord, I pray that they would, even through this live stream right now, that it would be a game changer, that it would be a life changer, that they would see that the reason that everything is just the way it is inside of them, the reason there's such a mess on the inside is because something other than you is in that most holy place and, and that, Lord, they would kick whatever's there out. And that, God, they would put you where you belong. That, Lord, there would be a salvation experience that happens right now. That they would surrender their lives to you, confessing their sins, inviting you to come into their heart because of the, the sacrifice that they see that you've made for them. And Lord, for, for those that are Christians listening today, that Lord, this would be a strong reminder that you are a jealous God. Lord, there's a lot that you're not jealous of, but that place that you created in us for you that, you, that you would dwell, that place where you would dwell, Lord, you're jealous of that place. And that, Lord, we would guard it with everything that we have so that you could be the wellspring, so that you could be the fire, so that you could be the truth, so that you could be our everything that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you again for coming today. I hope today that your heart was lifted up through the worship, through the word, anticipation. I'm telling you, I'm anticipating this room being filled with all of you. And so even if you're listening today and before this whole COVID-19 thing happened, maybe you weren't part of our church, but you've been listening. When these doors are open, you've got to be here because you're, you're part of us. You're part of our family. We want you to know that. We love you. And, and we may not even have met yet. Because you're part of the family of God. Pray that you'd have a great week. I'll be praying for you. Shannon will be praying for you. Our pastors will be praying for you. Our leadership will be praying. Believe in God for you. So let's go strong for the Lord and keep him at the center. God bless and have a great week. Who